Noah is something. His old furniture, his old cat, his trips. You think he's happy? I think he's lonely. Don't overdo it. He has us. We have everything here. Why go looking elsewhere? Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 86, which is Cole's choice. What did you pick today? I chose 35 Shots of Rum from 2008, directed by Claire Denis, one of my all-time favorite filmmakers, and starring Alex Decaux, Maddie Diop, Nicole Doguet, Grégoire Collin, and Juliette Mars Toussaint. How did I do on that French there? Pretty darn good. It's about a widower who has been raising his daughter in Paris on his own since she was very young and the struggles that they encounter now that she's reaching an age where it is time for her to leave home. So let's talk about how apparently Claire Denis read my diary and crafted an opening of a film that feels like it was made just for me. It begins with this vantage point that immediately puts me in mind of Tom Waits and the song Ninth and Hennepin that I've seen it all through the yellow windows of the evening train feeling. I love trains. So I feel immediately comforted by all these sights and sounds. And the point of view in this scene is also a great example of how I think Denis puts so much detail in elliptically. She gives you a lot to work with, but asks something of you in return. In some cases, you're doing work you're not even aware of. In this example, we're on the train. We're not shown an engineer, but that's our obvious touchstone as we are looking forward rather than out a side window. There aren't a lot of frenetic cuts. It's a point of view that is observant, steady, and calm. There's a short horn blast that feels like a friendly acknowledgement of some people working by the tracks which gives you an idea of the temperament of the engineer, or at least his mood at the time. This is all a respite from the workaday commuter feeling that you might instinctively associate with being on a train at this time of day. So without ever once being overt or obvious, and without even a single facial expression, we're given the impression of someone cheerfully going about their work and taking satisfaction in it. Or at least that's the impression I'm left with. If you don't romanticize trains the way I do, do these feel just like impersonal location shots? Not quite. I don't think I romanticize trains the way that you do, but this didn't necessarily feel cheerful. It did, however, feel satisfied. Part of that was understanding that we're on the air au air line, which is the commuter train section. As you mentioned, this is not inside of Paris proper. So I definitely get that commuter feel, as you mentioned. We're connected out to the suburbs, which is something that I can relate to. I should mention this is another one of those elliptical details that if you have a larger understanding of where you are and what's happening, that Denis is acknowledging one of her regular preoccupations, and that is class and being an exile in an immigrant community. Because Paris is set up The exact opposite, as we think of major American cities. The suburbs are where the lower economic strata lives versus the inner city. It's kind of flip-flopped. And the other mood that this put me into was one of a bit of melancholy. And that's because of the music and also because of all of this guessing that I started to try to do right away. What is it about the music that feels that way or that's notable to you? It starts out before we see any images in an almost eerie soundtrack. But again, this could all be based on assumptions that I brought into this. That's going to be a big topic of discussion, I think, in this. Not just with the music, definitely with the music, but also with a bunch of other stuff. The way we're conditioned to watch and listen. It's true. And I deliberately did not read much about this. This was my first viewing of the film. And so all I knew is that I was about to watch a drama, not a comedy, and that I was going to probably be seeing a lot of these different themes that she works with that you had started to touch upon, and that I was going to need to fill in some blanks because she's not going to connect those dots for us right away. 
And I also knew, this was one of the very brief things that I read, that she takes a lot of time with her titles. So I think I was conditioning myself to think something major is going to happen here. People are not happy somehow. So when I hear this sort of eerie music that transitions into almost an American folk style, but that which feels unmistakably French, and I know I'm in the suburbs, and I'm watching these train tracks, and then I see my first faces. Funny that it feels that way to you, because that's a note that I have about why I don't respond to Tinder Sticks, who did the score, as much. They're neither American nor French. They're from the UK. All I can say is, everything I thought might be happening or was going to happen was entirely 100% <laughs> wrong every step of the way. So your first experience with Tinder Sticks too, I assume then? You're not a big fan? I didn't know them before this. Okay. Well, from my years in the record store, I like them, don't love them. There are other bands with similar elements that I prefer if I'm just doing some listening. Low, Sparkle Horse, Calexico. And when I list them, I realize there's maybe an inherent Americanness that I respond to because all three of those bands are very regional American bands. This is not to say that Tinder Sticks don't do a fantastic job with the score. The music works very well, like it does in all of their collaborations with Denis. I think they've done six with her by now. But while we're on the subject, and I'm thinking about it, I would like someone to take the low song, Murderer, and stretch it out to a feature-length film without sacrificing any of the feeling that they evoke in about three minutes. So someone get right on that. I think that's going to have to be you, babe. <laughs> so rather than feeling romantic or deeply melancholy, I felt like I was a French person riding the rails. Side note, I love the fact that the engineer's name is Lionel, or in English, Lionel. That name is inextricable from trains for anyone who ever had a model railroad. The Lionel train, along with the Easy Bake Oven, was the very first toy ever inducted into the Toy Hall of Fame. So Lionel and trains are synonymous for me. Since you specifically mentioned the people on the train, it's worth noting that all the passengers are people of color. So if we know we're in Paris and we know we're heading toward the suburbs, like you say, we know that we are likely traveling largely among its immigrant community. All of this combined, it evokes for me at least, maybe not cheerful, maybe that's taking it too far, but a pleasant, if subdued mood and just as importantly, gives us a distinct feeling of place. In fact, of place within a place. It is really good filmmaking that trusts its audience. I think subdued is the perfect word. I think that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. And when we first see our glimpses of Lionel, he seems like a subdued person as well. We see him smoking at different times of the day. And here comes wrong assumption number 3023. <laughs> Because of that span of time where we see him out of doors, not inside the train, I thought maybe this is a father who has lost his job and hasn't told anyone yet. I think at this point I should stop getting into all of these assumptions because they don't play a part in this, only in that sense, like you were saying, of what we might be trained to think. I'm also really glad that I was wrong because I think that film would have been incredibly uninteresting. Well, we do spend a long time with him. We see dusk turn to evening, and I got more of a sense that this is his ritual. I did have the advantage of this being the second time that I've seen it. But even the first time, I think it felt much more to me that he takes pleasure in the smoking and having this time specifically for himself. I think the thing that made it feel different than you were guessing is that at no point does he feel hurried or anxious. And just as importantly, neither does the film. Now, you've mentioned it a couple times, and we were talking after we watched it about how Denis parcels out her information, and this being your first time watching it, how you were trying to puzzle through who these characters were, what you were being shown, how the personalities fit together. Were you ever frustrated by it, or was the way that it unfolded satisfying to you? Never frustrated at any moment, and not anxious either. I knew that those secrets were going to be revealed to the extent that she will ever reveal those kinds of secrets. I delighted in every moment of this. This is a film that I think I could live inside. I enjoy unhurried and unrushed. And I enjoy too that every face we see is a warm face. This is a person you want to know and spend time with. 
Well, we'll soon get a glimpse of another one of those faces in this opening sequence when we see a young woman buying a rice cooker from a shop window. I'm all in at this point. My favorite kitchen implement that I have ever purchased is my rice cooker. If I was only allowed to keep one item for my kitchen, it would be that thing. Are we going to have to do a mini episode about rice cookers? We may. I love my rice cooker so much. I still remember the trip to get it 16 years ago. I got it at one of the Asian supermarkets in North Austin. I still remember what it sounded like, what the store smelled like, where that shelf was in the store. It was such a pleasurable experience to go get it, pick it out, bring it home, make that first batch of rice in it. I think I may have a deeper connection to kitchens than you. I worked in them for 11 years and I have always cooked. And you were in the service industry, but were you more in the kitchen or more front of house? I've done both, but my kitchen duties were more about presenting the food that had already been made. For example, I worked in a bakery, so I wasn't the baker. But we also had a taco bar, so I did a little bit of work there. But no, I don't think I have the same connection to kitchens. Well, even with that, do you have a favorite kitchen tool that you rely on or would be your desert island implement? I really like my mini magic bullet. And that's some sort of blender, not a sex toy, right? Right. Okay. I like that other one too. (laughs) And I also love the Instant Pot that you got for me. By the way, it makes rice. Not like a rice cooker does. Okay. No, I don't have a favorite kitchen implement then. I do know you love food films, though, because we did a Patreon bonus episode about them. We talked about some of our favorites. So then does that mean the enjoyment of all of that is more in the consumption or the artistry of preparation or some of both? What is it that appeals to you about that? Here's the bottom line. I like to eat. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, it's about the food. That's the connection. I like to be in the kitchen in so much as I like to see you preparing my food that I know is going to be good when it goes in my belly. Well, I like to eat too, and especially rice. I love rice as a choice here. Just as a personal preference, it is my favorite grain, so that's just one more thing that I identify with. I can imagine that slightly popcorny aroma of jasmine rice in the house and the anticipation for dinner the click of the cooker switching over into warming mode. It tastes so good and it's so versatile. I could live on it. But as a symbol, it's important here too. Rice is a cheap meal. It's comfort food. It's a staple of more than half of the world's population. In terms of the volume of consumption, it's the single fastest growing staple in Africa with consumption doubling since 1970. So even though Lionel and Josephine have been in Paris for a long time, some of the other people that we saw on the train, for instance, may have more recently immigrated and depend on rice in a different way. We don't see that, though. That's more of the elliptical that Denis gives us permission to indulge in. What we do have is a serene and decidedly everyday working class dinner scene. So all of these things that I just described, that I relate to, that make it feel like it's especially for me, the trains, the rice... The satisfaction of quiet observation, the room that Denis gives us to infer things. All of that has happened, and she has firmly established this tone of tranquility, and it's been six and a half minutes before anyone speaks. Six and a half minutes of opening a film with zero dialogue, and that makes me feel like I am already home. Another benefit to that approach is that, in general, this is a light dialogue film, and so if you're a student of the French language like I am, It's really easy to follow, which is kind of fun. Just thought I'd throw that in there for our fellow Francophiles. So now that we've gotten through that opening section, we meet Joe, Josephine. And this is a person that I understood. I see her coming into the apartment, starting in on those what seem to be daily chores. Her laundry, tidying up, you put your shoes away, you put your jacket away. And I realized as I was watching her do the laundry and then that moment where she smiles when she hears the bell, that I just like her face so much. And that's not just because she's beautiful, which she is. There's just something else. So then when Lionel comes in and they kiss, we know that these are people with a warm relationship. They're happy to see each other. And we begin to put the pieces together that they're family, that they're not lovers or roommates. In fact, they are father and daughter. And that's a relationship that we come to understand through these chores, through laundry, through cooking, through that smile that you mentioned, the house shoes, all of this beautiful, gentle domesticity. 
it turns out that they've each bought a rice cooker. They are clearly aligned. They are moving in very close sync with one another. I assumed that they were father-daughter only because I had read that, and so that was my guess, based on the two first people that we meet. But it wasn't entirely clear, really until we see the picture of the father and the baby girl and understand that that's them. I'm not as familiar or as experienced in seeing that level of physical affection between a parent and a child. And that could just be born of my personal experience. Or maybe it's my Americanness. But I loved the detail of seeing them eat at the table that has clearly been arranged for just two people. Another one of those great details where your mind is processing things that you don't even realize you're doing the work. I think about what we've described here, and I can't help but think about what a more mainstream film goer might say about this, and just exactly how much work there is to do, if that's even what people want. I think I'm in the distinct minority with how much I like films to be free of dialogue and for them to be reflections of our everyday. The common argument you might hear against that is that, quote, nothing is happening, unquote. And that's not how I think of it. That's not how you think of it either, correct? Absolutely not. And I'll try to keep the disdain out of my voice because I understand that people go into films for different reasons and some people prefer escapism or to maybe set their brain aside for a few moments. But I would rather be intrigued. Yeah, I think that saying nothing is happening is obviously incorrect, but it's just worded wrong. It's classifying it incorrectly. Maybe the vocabulary is not quite there to describe what they think they're seeing there are things happening, and they're just real things, on their surface, unspectacular things. If you were to ask most people, though, I think they would be forced to admit that the subject of this film, their child leaving home, is an epical event. It's monumental, but just not in the way that they associate with what happens in a lot of bigger movies. And I think it's interesting that you frame it that way, from the parent's perspective. Because from the child's perspective, I'm making this huge transition as well. And I think the great benefit to this film is that we feel each of those perspectives. Yes, I just don't think that that fits often with what people want out of their film-going experience. It doesn't have the epic scope or the feeling of spectacle. And most importantly, the escape that you referred to. What's depicted in this film is the type of event that a lot of people are seeking relief from by going to the movies. They don't want to relive it there, too. They want explosions, otherworldly intrigue, something easier to digest. So I'm left wondering, if that's the case, how do you get a mainstream audience to embrace a film like this? Okay, I don't want that job. Can I withdraw <laughs> my name from consideration? I guess as with anything, you just try to draw parallels and give people an idea of what they might find that would be appealing to them. Well, I think comfort is a big thing. And you mentioned this specifically. I saw this first on the big screen at the Paramount. It's even better than I remember. And it made a huge impression on me the first time. The crux of it, I think, is that it is a film made for getting comfortable with. When you become part of its family is when you get the most from it. And it doesn't suffer from being on the small screen either. In fact, I think it might feel more intimate with home viewing. And I would rarely say that, but this is one of those cases. I wonder if this is going to strike you the same way the next time you see it, if it will evolve or grow in your estimation between now and then. I think it will only grow because we talked about the different perspectives. These different characters are on their own tracks. And I know who I relate to now versus who I might have related to 20 years ago or 20 years from now. Well, now that we're comfortable with Lionel and Josephine, Denis begins to introduce the other main characters. And these aren't just neighbors. They make up what we will come to know as sort of an extended family to Lionel and Josephine. Perhaps they even want to be more than that, as they are aware of each other's comings and goings in a way that is clearly more than casual. We first meet Noé. He's a young man coming up the stairs. He hears the music that Joe has turned on coming from inside the apartment. He stops and waits and listens. Is he friend or foe? Is he going to complain about the music? Is that why we're hearing it? Or is he deciding whether to go knock on the door? He has a cat waiting for him in his own apartment, so I thought he can't be all that bad. Though, of course, I'm sure there are criminals out there with cats, too. 
I get the feeling that the cat might be somewhat neglected, or at least a little lonely due to his schedule. I think Denis is subtly contrasting the stability of family and routine with the perceived unpredictability or inconsistency of life as a single young man in Paris. The next great touch that I see is that Jo has decided to not show her father the rice cooker that she also bought. And that is a touch that will have resonance all the way up to the very last scene of the film. In the meantime, the final piece of our familial puzzle is Gabrielle, a taxi driver. A woman that strikes me as being Lionel's contemporary, in terms of age. For many moments, okay, I realized I said I was not going to talk about my assumptions, but this was (laughs) a big one. I wasn't sure if she was actually Joe's mother. She wishes. She's pretty awesome, too. Another great face. We're introduced to her at work, and the fare that she picks up says taxi drivers always complain, but that doesn't seem genuinely true of her or almost anyone that we meet. I get the impression, before we dig into it, that these characters are generally happy or content with where they find themselves, do you? I agree, and I think Gabrielle's comment about wishing for longer rides is that she likes to spend time with the people who have taken the ride with her. She enjoys the trip and the conversation and the company. You do note to start with, and it comes up often, there's kind of a melancholy undertone to everything. But to me, it just makes all of these reactions and relationships like everything else in the film. It's very real. Grief does color a lot of what these characters think about and do, but it's not a somber film. There are some good days, some bad. They're generally content, but reasonably thinking about what else might be out there in store for them. You could count it as a failing of mine that I don't walk around talking about how great everything is every moment of the day. I'm probably one of those people who is thinking of this thing that might happen in the future. So you're not watching Sally Hawkins and Happy Go Lucky. Well, we've met all the main players now, but unlike most films that tell a story like this, the things that connect this family remain undisclosed for the most part. One of the things I like most about how this film works is how the structure is so sneakily complicated. When you compare it to her other films, on the surface it seems less fragmented, but each ensuing scene makes it so that you have to go back and reevaluate what you thought to be true what you assumed about who these people are and how their relationships work. And I think that what makes all of that viable is that they are very definitely real people with lived-in lives. I see a lot of connections to other filmmakers, actually, who work in similar styles. I see some of the Dardan brothers and Mike Lee in this realistic approach to working-class characters and chronicling the difficulty of simply getting by. The Dardans are also similarly interested in immigrant stories, Ozu is an obvious touchstone. That connection is so deeply felt that Denis abandons a lot of her usual hallmarks. This is clearly homage from the subject matter to the fact that this has more static shots than we usually see from her. I'll catalog more of those Ozu connections when I get to my recommendation, but in the meantime, were there other filmmaker connections that came to mind for you? Definitely those that you mentioned, and also maybe Chantal Ackerman. We had talked about Jean Dielman in a previous episode, and I think about that closely observed parent-child relationship and also the closely observed moments in everyday life. My only quibble with your characterization is that this doesn't feel as if they are struggling in the economic sense. I have counterpoint that will come along the way. Okay. To me, they felt like they were on more solid ground than I think of as lower middle class. They felt more comfortable than that. I do see what you mean. It's not that Dardan brothers feeling of we're one bad day from the street. Is that what you mean? It is. It doesn't feel like the struggle is where our next dollar is going to come from. Well, all of those things, what they have in common is that it's a very direct style of filmmaking, that there is not much artifice between you and these characters and the story. And the thing that allows me to get close to this movie is how much everyone is loving and direct, thoughtful about the work they do, what they study, the lives they lead. It engenders a real affection for them in me. Some filmmakers are clearly indifferent to their characters, but not Claire Denis. The way the camera regards them betrays how she feels about them, I think. She thinks they're beautiful and sides with the exiles and the outsiders. Hence, it makes it easy to sympathize with her characters, even in her more turbulent films. 
I think that's all because for a filmmaker that the mainstream would regard as cerebral, she seems to work more for me on instinct. You see it with a lot of filmmakers that are so preoccupied with certain themes that they return to them again and again. All of this comes from her personal history, her gut, at the very least an even balance between head and heart. It's not all philosophizing. Let's get back to the trains again, back to the workplace. And we see them from a number of angles, the trains themselves, the tracks, the cameras, the systems. And I think about how something is in motion so often in this film, even in moments of stillness. And the next motion we're about to see is more of a transition. And that's for Lionel's colleague, René. He's obviously very emotional. He's packing up his locker taking his belongings, so this is an ending of some sort, and we find out that it is his retirement. He doesn't want to go. It's clear how much he's struggling, and Lionel, like I assume he is for a number of people, is a steadying influence and a sounding board for René. Some people's faces just make it clear who is a rudder and who is not. This retirement party is kind of a melancholy affair, like most office parties turn out to be, and by the end of it, everyone is together, but separate still, on the train ride home. René is adrift in retirement, but their work is not his calling either, I get the feeling. So he's adrift, period. And he now has a long time to think about that. It seems like his life is now stretching out before him, and not in a good way. It doesn't seem like he's going to seize this opportunity to do all of those things that he didn't have time for. And so his work has clearly served some purpose in his life, and without it, we have to be a little bit concerned for him. I understand the tiniest fraction of this feeling. You can attest to this. I have not exactly been myself since I left my job a few months ago. It's been a struggle, and that's with having a lot to fill my days. I have purpose and activity, but there's a treading water feeling to it that I don't like, and any semblance of routine or regular sleep has long since gone out the window. I tend to keep my own counsel, so I'm fortunate in the regard that I am more Lionel than René, but I at least mildly understand all of a sudden feeling vaguely undefined. I realize that René is the character I most identify with as well, and not really for those reasons. What is it that draws you to this character? I think I'm always going to be drawn to people with a deep well of sadness in them. <laughs> I think also that I identify with that feeling of once you get the thing that you thought you wanted, it's not quite the thing that you wanted at that time. I'm sitting right here. You're the exception to that, honey. <laughs> uh, seriously, though, I don't want anybody to think for a second, even joking, that that's the case. No, it really is more about those external things. Because sometimes I can't make my interior life feel great. Well, Lionel is not immune to what he observes either. Denise said that Rene essentially functions as an alarm clock for Lionel. Spurred by this conversation and what he sees happening inside his friend, he sits Josephine down to advise her to think of herself. He gives her the reassurance she needs to be free, but is any part of this conversation easy to have? The one thing I can think of is that he likely feels that he's a young man himself. Descartes was 50 when this film was made, just a couple years older than I am now, and I know that I don't imagine I'm halfway or more done. I still have a lot to do, but even with feeling like a much younger man, I don't necessarily identify with that analog in the film, no way. Lionel is obviously the character I identify with the most. I don't see the confusion and the unsettled nature of the younger characters as relatable to where I am now. As an example, at one point, in acknowledging that Noé has no attachments, Josephine asks, what's holding you back then? And he cannot be entirely honest with either her or himself about that yet. I just feel like I understand myself better than these 20-odd-year-old people do, just based on accumulated experience. Is it a similar case for you? I assume you don't see as much of yourself and where you are now in Josephine. Do we focus on Lionel because of our age? How much does it affect how you frame the story? Because I see it as primarily Lionel's story, at least, say, 5149. If you saw this 20 years ago, like you said, would you have seen this as primarily Josephine's story? I think I might have. And even then, 
I didn't experience the typical breaking away. I was ready to go. And my parents, I think, essentially groomed me that way. They set me up to be independent and not to have to be told, to go ahead and live your own life. And that also makes me think of those parallel tracks of grief, Rene and Lionel. The scene before we have this talk, Joe has told Gabrielle that she can't come over, she can't have dinner with her, she has studying to do. She gently but firmly pushes her away. And I think that's more about this relationship that she and her father and this way of life that they have created for themselves. Lionel, whether he realizes it or not, or this could just be my read, has channeled that grief into building this wonderful relationship. But it's one where they have a set rhythm and she has set responsibilities that she's taken on to care for him. Much more in the way of a partner than a child. Again, at least to me, that's my read on it. So I think he is definitely the anchor. And I think that's what we respond to regardless of our age. Well, he does have such a great face like we both have already talked about. It really communicates how he's a keen observer. It's not exactly passivity, but stillness, a word you've used already. Stillness has a connotation of strength and intention for me that passivity doesn't. I also like what Denise says about casting Maddie D up, and you nailed this not even knowing that. She didn't want her to be only pretty, which she certainly is, but that she wanted her to be brave and intelligent, which you can also see in her face, and I think that elevates simple prettiness to true beauty. I respond most to what I see happening behind someone's eyes, and on that count, you are on the money. Everyone in this film has a great face. At this point, I'm not going to rhapsodize anymore about their physical beauty. I'm starting to feel like I focus on that a little too much. I don't want to be that person that can't talk about an actor or an actress without talking about their physical attributes. In this particular case, I feel like it's a perfectly legitimate conversation to have because I feel like it is definitely a signature element of what Claire Denis does. She is specifically so good at transforming physical sensation into something that you understand while you watch it. And physical beauty and grace is a huge part of that. And that thing I said about how you can tell how she feels about her characters by the way the camera regards them, Regarding their physical beauty is definitely a component of that that she indulges in. That is a good point. She does talk about how much she just likes to watch people being physical, how their bodies work. I guess I just don't want to make sexual implications about everything and turn that gaze on everybody. Well, then let's talk about grief again instead. How about that? You know that's right up my alley. I mentioned earlier that one of the tonal underpinnings of the film is that grief is ever-present, but not overwhelming. That doesn't quite take everything into account for our main characters, though. It's true for Lionel and Josephine, but I think the equivalent on the other side for Gabrielle and Noé is loneliness. I think of these two things as two sides of the same coin, but the crucial difference is how people respond to them. Grief leads to this self-imposed isolation that you were referring to. It's evident in the scene that we did at the opening of the show where he says, we have everything here. Why do you need to go looking for anything somewhere else? It's a method to protect themselves from having to feel pain like that again. On the other side, the isolation isn't as desirable and those characters, particularly Gabrielle, go to great lengths to remedy that situation. This character really annoys me while managing to remain sympathetic somehow. It's quite the feat. I think you're a crazy person. <laughs> okay, how's that? I think she's incredibly sympathetic. Not even sympathetic. I don't think there's anything to fault her on. Maybe it's her music choice that enthralls me. That's one of her try-too-hard things, though. I don't think that she is. But, again, maybe I'm taking all of these years that we haven't seen into account and bringing all of this experience to bear that I think has taken place. I do have a question along those lines, but I want to save it for a little bit. She has that beautiful moment earlier with Joe where she's asking her to come in and have dinner. And she talks about that childhood memory of it was so easy when you were little, you would just crawl into bed with me. So again, whether or not they've meant to, she's taken on the role of a mother. Is she supposed to just set that aside? 
and she clearly has feelings for Lionel. I can't blame her for that. Who knows what's taken place between them? Who knows what's developed or not? Well, as I am wont to do, I have thought ahead and have answers for every single one of those things. I'm about to rip you a new one. How do you like that? Nerd alert. <laughs> so you clearly have a strong feeling about her. And it seems like you maybe almost think she's a creep. I have a strong feeling about this kind of behavior and how much it would affect me if it were within my sphere. For example, when she is waiting at one of Lionel's favorite haunts, where Rene also happens to be spending more of his time, she's trying to insinuate herself into his life. But Lionel likes the status quo, his routine, no complications. Just look at his choice of occupation as engineer. It's a fixed track, repetition, a well-worn groove, a job that a competent man can do in his sleep, a job with few interruptions or distractions that gives you time to think about whatever pleases you. And the thing that I am responding to most negatively, probably, that is not tugging on your sleeve for attention all the time. I still... Upon reflection, don't see her doing that. So I would love to hear what other people think and how they interpreted that as well. Oh, I'm not done. I've got some things okay. that may really change how you think about it, if you think about it for a second. Okay. Think about if the genders were flipped. Is this acceptable behavior or is this a little stalkery? Think about a widow and her son living in their bubble and a male neighbor is clearly in love with her and is hanging around being the, quote, nice guy until she comes to her senses, and she sees that he's always been there for her, showing up where she likes to hang out, presumptuously buying concert tickets, most significantly trying to usurp the dead husband's place however gently by performing husband-slash-father duties when it is clear no such invitation to do so has been extended. You read into that. We never see that on screen if you think that's what she's doing. I agree with you that we don't see the invitation, but we also don't see the lack of the invitation. I think you're giving her more room to move than you would give if the situation were reversed. If this is a male character, your instinct wouldn't be 50-50, benefit of the doubt, maybe off screen, he was extending an invitation that we didn't see. You would think this guy is pushing and he needs to back off. That's quite possible, but I would also have to go back to the film again and realize that that's the same level of assumption making as what I've been positing. We don't see the lack of the invitation, and we don't see the invitation. So if we don't see either one, what should your default be? I guess I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt, and that's probably informed by how gentle and attractive she is. And... I can't rely on that. I just said that I don't want to keep going down that path of relying on people's physical beauty. So I just have to be more logical and not constantly make these assumptions. But it's difficult in this film. That's true. I have said several times myself already how much room she gives you to infer background, motivation, how much Denis insists that the viewer do the work and make the connections themselves. It's just that the connections you made are bananas. Okay. <laughs> Noe's intrusion, for example, doesn't play as quite as severe. He actually makes it into the house. He's invited into the house when he's dropping off a key for them to take care of the cat while he's gone. And Lionel says, make him a plate. Tellingly, though, when the three of them have breakfast, they're all three standing in a row with Lionel between the two, no one getting comfortable. And so here is the presumptive nature of how I viewed Noé. I mistrusted him through the bulk of the film. I thought he had some nastier, possibly ulterior motive, and that was also based on his appearance and clothing. And it turns out that none of that is the case. As you mentioned, his biggest fault is not being able to realize and accept the truth and then speak that truth. Just because he has slicked back hair and unbuttons his shirt really low doesn't mean he's a bad guy. So whereas I give Gabrielle the benefit of the doubt, I wasn't prepared to do that for him. Precisely what I'm saying. If he is the neighbor and the widow is across the hall and you see this character doing that, when you are trying to decide was an invitation extended, not extended, you're going a completely different way. 
and he's not nearly as pushy. Definitely, he holds back, hangs back all the time. Before we get too much further afield, let's go back to the bar. After Gabrielle leaves Renee and Lionel to their conversation, Renee returns a book that he had borrowed, and this is not a good sign. This is when I knew what was coming. Settling these little accounts always feels like the writing is on the wall. Absolutely. I knew what that meant the moment that I saw it. Lionel doesn't protest, though. He draws no attention to it. He doesn't argue at any development. He takes things as they come, catalogs them, mulls them over, but doesn't impose his will. He offers something that may be helpful, but leaves it to the individual to decide what to do with it. For instance, later when Rene rides along on the train at work one day, Lionel offers that when he gets dark thoughts, he thinks of his daughter. This is the answer for Lionel, but ultimately not Rene. Eventually, Rene lays down on the tracks. Unable to extricate himself from this relationship to his work, it finally kills him. I'm getting a little ahead of us with that, though. Let's go back a step and talk about the evening of the concert that Gabrielle got tickets for. But before we get to the evening of the concert, we see Jo and she has a job in a music store. And we briefly get introduced to another character, one of her school colleagues, Reuben. He's come into the store and they're clearly watching each other, interested in each other. Is this another one of those instances where the assumption you make is wrong? Usually when I see a situation like this where girl working by herself late at night, somewhat large guy looking at her furtively, I at least momentarily have to fear for her safety. I didn't. It didn't feel set up that way for me. It doesn't feel furtive. It feels like they're kids. He invites her to this concert not knowing that she was already planning to go. And clearly that's going to get stifled at least for the moment because Lionel is waiting for her as she's getting off of work. Lionel takes them home on his motorbike. She's riding behind him in a position that she clearly loves. She's enjoying that ride. I do think it's interesting to note that right before this ride, he delivers what is the only paternal edict of the whole thing. You need to quit this job because he fears for her safety. But like you say, all of that immediately goes away when they get on and she's got her arms around him. I don't think it immediately goes away because it feels like another romantic idea has been stifled, as we were just talking about, in place of this relationship. He's told her what he wants from her for her safety, delivering this edict, while they then have this physical closeness again, and then it gets even more complicated. Yeah, this preparation for the concert, everyone is fussy and frustrated with this night out before it even begins, it feels like. To begin with, there's too much boundary crossing. Guess who that is? Well, for one, Lionel is pissed that Joe is ironing for him. She doesn't have to be a maid or a wife. But this isn't the first time she's ever done that. He doesn't like the curler in her hair. He's just sullen. But I know you had someone else in mind. Well, all that does to me is point out how every single time Gabrielle comes around, he's irritated. You see it in the cafe. You see it right here. You see it later when it comes to wedding day. Even if an invitation had been extended at one point, it has since been rescinded. I don't know how much more clear he can make that. On top of that, Reuben shows up with flowers for Josephine, making things a little bit awkward with Noé. So things are already off to a difficult start, and then the car breaks down in the rain on the way to the show, and Gabrielle refuses to grasp the symbolism of this malfunction. Is the symbolism man's inhumanity to man? That was always my favorite guess <laughs> is, in school. Is that what Volvo represents to you? <laughs> Sob. Sob is man's inhumanity to man. Pun intended. Well, anyway, the proprietor lets them back into this bar cafe where they had just been, and her kindness begins to ripple outward. It salvages the evening, and it sets up this linchpin scene of the film. We could probably make this entire episode about this scene alone. Alliances shift, life-changing decisions are catalyzed, there is love, Jealousy, anxiety, seduction. Did you recognize from the first seconds of the song, Night Shift? Oh, heck yeah. When I was young, and when Haley, my sister, was even younger, nothing got a laugh out of her more than 
when I would do the falsetto part at the end of that song. That was one of my favorite things to do to make her laugh. Inappropriate. Do you think that's just us, though? I could recognize that song from 20 miles away. Maybe not just us, but definitely generational. Past a certain point, I don't think it's as widely recognized. It's a fascinating musical choice here. And I can't imagine anything else in its place, even as odd as it is tonally the subject matter of it to hear here. Odd because it's such an old song relative to the time. Odd because it's an American pop song and you expect it to hear maybe Tropical FM or whatever the radio station is that they referred to. It's an American pop song about fallen pop musicians, a memorial for your friends, and it's a deeply seductive song here. Well, then you're right. It's perfect. It's exultant, but still it's elegiac. It has this undertone of grief that the rest of the movie has. It happens at a pivotal moment in a pivotal scene. We start first with Lionel and Gabrielle dancing. Joe won't dance. But then her father convinces her to dance. But, tellingly, then Noé cuts in. And that song is playing while Lionel is watching them and doesn't seem happy about what he's seeing. I don't know that I could exactly blame him. I'm not sure what the motivations are, but Noé takes Josephine's hair down. She is a grown woman. He's watching her be sexual, and it's difficult. And her reaction shows how conflicted she is about this whole thing. She wants to encourage what is finally a declaration from Noé, but not knowing how to do this in front of her father. Because it doesn't exactly feel like the first time that they've kissed, but even if it's the first or the second or the 20th, you don't really want this to play out right now in front of all of these people. But it's significant that it does, with Noé being so non-committal up until now. The fact that he's willing to do this right here, right now, is what swings the pendulum for her, I think. That great touch, though, that she pulls away and gets him to sit down, and they're at opposite tables, not sitting together, but still very close, and the looks on their faces say everything. And then that other fascinating shift happens, that other choice, Lionel starts to dance with that incredibly gorgeous young bar proprietress. Gabrielle is relegated to the sidelines, like she has been so many times for so long. Is this your favorite scene in the whole thing? I have favorite moments, for instance, when Lionel is with Rene in the stairwell before his retirement, and he shows him such affection and steadiness when he needs that, but for complete extended scenes, I think this is my favorite. There's one coming up that I absolutely adore as well. We'll get there in just a few moments. I think it may be the same as mine too, but... But this feels earth-shattering when it takes place. And I think I'm feeling all of those emotions. I'm watching. I'm being in it. I'm feeling excitement for the first time. I'm feeling some regret and hesitation. And as if I'm at the edge of the cliff, am I going to jump off? And is the jumping off going to be a good thing? Well, this is what I was saying about Her attention to physicality, you're exactly right. The camera gets in so close and we feel all these bodies in motion. And it's a tense and awkward night, ultimately, that runs everyone completely through a gamut of emotions. Every relationship in the film turns on this event and everything is communicated completely wordlessly. Lionel withdraws so that Josephine can make the choices that she needs to make and this break between father and daughter is formalized right here. Do you think that she would leave without the gentle push that he gives her right here? I think that to answer that question discounts the role that Noé plays in this. I think she has to be headed towards the right thing. I don't think of her as a person who's just looking for any way out. She's like her father that way? Is that something that she's gotten from him? I totally agree. I think she's much more intelligent and deliberate than that. She's not headstrong. But I do think at the same time, it's a necessary part of her growth and transition. I also think it's equally important for him to have done it for himself. Him here being Lionel? Yes. I read what we see a little bit later, and I'm not jumping ahead, but it's just to make this point. When we see him coming back separately eating that croissant, I read it as he stayed with the woman. Mm -hmm. And that could have been one of the first times that that has happened. We also don't know that. We don't know that he had 
a string of girlfriends or steady relationships or monogamous relationships since the loss of Joe's mother. So I think he was giving himself permission. And it also seems like that could only take place if he at least feels that what she's doing is right as well. I think everyone, viewers and characters alike, feel like they are at this precipice that you talk about. They are looking over, deciding, is this when I jump? Maybe not even realizing that there is no other choice, that this is a point of no return. In the aftermath of that scene, we're all gathered at Noe's apartment, except Lionel. And we discover that his cat has died, a development about which he is decidedly unsentimental. Okay, I totally disagree. It is devastating to watch him put the cat in a trash bag along with all of the cat's toys. And it's the cat's toys that make the difference. I see it as he has to wipe the memory out because it is way too painful. He would have left the toys if he didn't care. I don't know that I 100% agree with that. I feel like you're coming at that as a cat person, maybe. If you came home... Oh, I don't even want to talk about... Okay. Well, <laughs> if something happened to Gibbo or Woody and we came across one of their toys, it would be devastating. Sure. That makes sense. And Noe is an orphan. And now he's been orphaned again. This last reminder, this last physical reminder of the life that he had with his parents is now gone. So I still think you're off base. Okay, I accept that. And you are right. It is the last thing that is keeping him here. So now, like everyone else, decisions must be made. That much is evident. Josephine knows this, and she's kind of in a cleaning frenzy as what seems like a coping mechanism right now. That is, until she builds up such a head of steam that she just goes to Noe's door and bangs on it like she's a cop. Even though these events are not catastrophic as we typically think of them, there is true turmoil in upsetting the careful order of things. Anything that intrudes on Josephine's and Lionel's isolation is a source of frustration, and I think all of that stems from what we've touched on. They have built this bubble, and that is all based on what, to me, looks like true devotion. And it seems like the depth of this feeling is something that some viewers just cannot deal with. Reading about the film, it's the one aspect more than any other that seems to make people uncomfortable. To me, it's another one of those Rorschach test things. It's an uncommon bond, perhaps, but to me, it's nothing at all approaching improper. So you're saying you didn't pick this on purpose to complete our trilogy of incest stories. <laughs> no, nothing like that. So there's not anything that's too familiar in their relationship. It's just something we're not used to seeing. Right. I asked earlier what would make this palatable to a mainstream audience. And in terms of dealing with this element, I have an idea. You make a prequel in which he's a workaholic dad that neglects his family until Josephine wishes for him to spend more time with him, blows out the candles on our birthday cake, and he's transformed into a sheepdog that drives the train until he learns his lesson. I think that's what that movie After Earth is about, right? With Will Smith? <laughs> I haven't seen it, though, so I'm not sure. It's a dad and a son, right? Right. It doesn't have the body-switching element that my great idea has that would make this devotion understandable in the aftermath of, because after seeing him come back from being the shaggy dog engineer, how could you possibly ascribe ulterior motives to this guy? Definitely. He's nothing but lovable. And it would make that scene where he picks her up after work at the record store a lot funnier. Bark, bark, bark. You should quit this job. <laughs> <laughs> and then she pets him and puts him in the sidecar of the motorcycle with a helmet and goggles on. And they zip around Paris and they go flubber the Eiffel Tower or however that works. Okay, that, I want to see this movie. Let's get it made. Seriously, though, it's almost a shame how much we are conditioned, even by Denis' other films, to expect something darker, more fraught with conflict. So much so that we can't appreciate that this is purely devotional. Okay, I think I'm probably then ascribing more to it because I see that cleaning frenzy and how angry she is with herself and with him as realizing that she's taken on more of a role as a partner than she needed to. Well, I don't know that you're ascribing more to her motivations than are there in that case. To me, that seems to do more with the work she is doing than any sort of romantic attachment. So there are two separate things, two separate ideas. Interestingly, we see this conditioning come up in other ways, too. She shoots characters from behind a fair amount, another thing that the Dardans do. 
And to U.S. audiences, that indicates suspense. Something bad or shocking is about to happen. The Dardans are guilty of that as well. But Denis counters that from a French point of view, it means anything can happen. So I guess from a Belgian point of view, it just means disaster. In France, I hope, shooting a character who is driving, looking from the passenger's seat toward the driver and taking in the entire driver's side window, apparently, does not necessarily mean they're about to be T-boned either. The point being, with our biases as viewers, we are imposing conditions on the film and the relationships therein that aren't necessarily there. Did you have that same sort of bias when we see them heading to Germany? Did you think, oh gosh, something else momentous is going to take place? It seemed abrupt and it struck me as an odd diversion the first time I watched it. This time it made much more sense as a closing of a chapter. We've seen Joe start to look through those family memories, looking more at her mother, reading letters from her mother. And this is an extension of that, maintaining a connection to her mother. They've driven to Germany to see her mother's sister, her aunt. Joe calls her ma'am tellingly, so it's not a close relationship. But it's a lot of memories that I think that she is both happy to experience and a little bit cautious of at the same time. Lionel sits back. He has that same stillness, which is something that her mother was attracted to him for. That's the source of one of my favorite reactions in the film. And it's when the aunt tells this story of when Lionel and her sister met. And I love the reaction because there's no reaction. He is, was, and always will be this stoic and leave room for others to tell their stories. He is steadfast and he can always be counted on. And it was only when I saw him regarding this recounting of what is arguably the most important moment in his life and not trying to take control of it, that I truly, fully understood who he was. I think I did in a slightly different way for a little bit of a different reason. It's a striking detail that they've lost her, and that was to illness. She died. She didn't leave them, which would be an entirely different film. And so I think it's important to see that they go to tend her grave. It's lovingly kept. And this is a family relationship that they're going to keep as well. And so then I think about all of those years in between, and again, how he has channeled that grief. I think it would have been totally different grief if there had been a rupture instead of a death. Well, this leads me to my second favorite scene, and what I'm guessing is probably yours as well. They camp on the beach, and we have this beautiful shot of some kids in this makeshift procession with their lanterns. And we see the two of them sleeping side by side under the stars in their sleeping bags. And this is the last moment that they will spend in their insulated, isolated world together. The transition that was formalized in the cafe is finalized on this camping trip. I was worried for a moment that when they say we could live like this forever, that they might. And then it just becomes Bonnie and Clyde, 2008, right there. No, more like Grey Gardens. (laughs) Well, it can't go on forever that way. And they return home to make preparations for what turns out to be Josephine and Noé's wedding day. He's even more brusque with Gabrielle after this trip that is a reminder of his wife, and he is simultaneously dealing with his daughter leaving home. If you are her, how do you not know that you shouldn't interfere with this? You don't know because you weren't on that trip. You're not thinking that this is the wrong moment to take a mother's place. That seems like something you should know. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm just trying to defend her, I'll stop. She is left to be a spectator. She's not allowed to participate to the degree that she obviously desires. Now, I'm not entirely against her. I do ask the same question that you, I think, asked at some point with regards to what came before that we didn't see. Does she have any legitimate claim? I wondered about their history and whether or not he ever indicated to her that there was possibility here. Was there ever a moment of weakness, grief-fueled or otherwise, that she has either rightly or wrongly latched onto? Well, it's two roles here. It's a mother and a wife. So she may have been fulfilling this mother role she tells us that she has. It's acknowledged. And maybe the other was just assumed or hoped for. I don't know. The thing for me that I keep coming back to is that nothing about his character that I observed 
especially with what I was just saying about the story of meeting his wife, leads me to believe that he would dangle any inkling of false hope in front of anyone. I agree. I don't think that he's been duplicitous at any point. If anything, maybe his phlegmatic demeanor makes him a cipher that she can project whatever she needs to upon. Or maybe he's just a handsome fella and who can blame her? I do come back to a question you asked earlier. Maybe we do rightly think about this film from his perspective because it ends with him as well. Two pivotal things are about to happen. The penultimate moment of the film is with Lionel having the titular 35 shots of rum. Now you mentioned the title. All things being equal, my initial reaction to the title is that it makes me care less about the movie. Sight unseen. My biases aside, this sounds crazy to me for scientific reasons. What span of time is this consumption supposed to take place in? Do you have any idea? No, I would say maybe a couple of hours? That's what I thought too. And so I broke out the calculator. And if the average 200 pound man, which is heavier than Lionel, I think, I don't think he weighs that much, did just 23 of these shots over two hours, his blood alcohol level would be 0.40. That is the accepted line at which it's 50-50 fatal. The thing is, in true Denis fashion, we don't know what the story or the mythos around the 35 shots of rum is. It's not something that seems to actually exist, and Lionel says he might have made up whatever this ritual is. We know that Renee's retirement party was not the right time for it, but this is. This is the moment to fulfill it. I also couldn't tell if it was supposed to be a community ritual. Maybe everybody takes a part in this, and maybe he takes the last shot. I don't know. But I don't think he's supposed to drink all 35 himself. Yeah, because to me that sounds insane. And by the math of it, it sounds dangerous. You're right, though. The ritual will only ever happen one time. And in addition to Renee's retirement party, I think the implication here is also he didn't do it when his wife died. So it's not for mourning. It's for celebration. Still, this celebration is a bittersweet one. Heartbreak and gladness intertwined. But there will never be another moment in his life like this. So here's to oblivion, literal or figurative. For the moment, at least, it's not oblivion. It's down to your favorite thing. Is this why you like the movie so much? Because our last image? That can't hurt things. This second rice cooker now comes in handy. I think it's a really beautiful note to end on. He discovers the one that Josephine bought that she did mention so as not to take away from his gesture of giving it to her as a gift. And my assumption is that he will now use the one that she tucked away as she takes the red one that he bought her to start her new home. Yeah, it's surely my bias kicking in, but there may be no better sound to indicate satisfactory and hopeful closure than the lid of a rice cooker clicking shut. It's better than children laughing. It's better than a new car door shutting. It's better than the sound that the doors make on the Starship Enterprise. It's perfect. There is boundless grace, hope, and nourishment in it. The end. I'm going to go have a bowl of rice now. Before do you do that, what else do we need to get to to cover this film to do it justice? I guess just our usual why I chose it. Aside from all the reasons that I've outlined, I think it just boils down to our basic mission. Remind people that this stuff is out there and what's great about it. Mainstream films obviously were on my mind a lot during this conversation. Plenty of people talk about those movies. They don't need us to champion them. It's the unique and idiosyncratic story that needs its signal boosted. And the box office shows that. As of this recording, in 2018... Of the top 10 grossing films, only one of them, A Quiet Place, isn't a comic book film, a cartoon, or a sequel in a huge franchise. You have to go back nine years to even get a second film in the top 10 that fits that criteria. So maybe I'm just pounding my head against the wall or preaching to the choir, but it at least makes me feel a little bit better to shine a light on a film that's a well-told story with real characters for adults. And I'm not saying abolish those other things. I watch them. I understand the need for modern mythology and all kinds of storytelling. I am just saying maybe literally make just one less of those per year and divert that time, money, and energy into something more nuanced and subtle. For the cost of the Avengers Infinity War, for example, at its cheapest estimate, you could have literally made 75 
35 shots of rum. Support the little guys once in a while. Maybe finally this is my answer to your question about, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, how to get butts in the seats. This is why I would have chosen this. It is amazing to me that a film can be informed by multiple cultures and experiences, none of which are exactly my own, and yet still expresses the universal. I guess the other thing that it's notable to me for is what a departure it is from Denis's usual style. It's still as elliptical and poetic as her other work, but it's not nearly as tumultuous. It's as good as her other films at representations of physical sensation, but it's that departure from what we're accustomed to that gives this such an impact. It's almost a lesson I learned from true crime. When someone varies from their established routine, that's what you pay attention to. That's when things become significant. It may be odd that this one is my favorite film of hers, actually, because I do tend to favor things that are more emotionally turbulent. I like being unsettled, and this is not that at all. It has a central paternal figure that is a reliable, devoted constant. Alienation is a regular theme of hers, and we have that in a very specific sense here, but typically she's more severe with it. In this case, it's more subtle and a product of the fact that two individual consciousnesses can only ever get so close. The classroom scene that we didn't talk about is probably the most blatantly Claire Denise scene in it. It displays her academic preoccupations with the legacy of French colonialism with some intellectual rigor. They're talking about very high-level global debt issues, mentioning the global south. It's the only time in the film that we see her regular themes discussed explicitly. The student revolt that follows is the only time we have any real hint of overt conflict. For the most part, it's the little things that remind us of life as an immigrant or outsider. Clues that an American audience might not even pick up on. And this is the thing that you made me think of all the way back at the very beginning. A Parisian, for example, would know right away that where they live is HLM housing. And that's sort of a rent-controlled, low-income housing where a lot of first and second generation immigrants live. These details are never at the forefront like they are in her other films, and I think that actually makes this film a little stronger. It's not stringent or didactic, it's just life. It's funny in that scene that you mentioned when she's in her university class that she's chided for being pedantic. Well, speaking of pedantic, why don't you tell us exactly what we should watch as further recommended viewing? I chose for my recommendation Stories We Tell from 2012, directed by Sarah Pauly, with Sarah Polly, Michael Polly, and Harry Gulkin. It's a documentary where Sarah Polly puts together the puzzle pieces of her family and a major secret that they kept for a long time. I thought about it because of, one, the very deep and beautiful parent-child relationship at the core of this. Her father took his own grief and channeled it into making her life the best that it could be, into encouraging her and helping her grow. I like that both films are working on the information that we're not told, and I was also inspired to choose this one because it's a great female director. I know we both love Sarah Polly, and I hope she continues to make wonderful films. I'm with you. I'm a huge Sarah Polly fan, and I wish she made a movie every year. Is this my chance to pull an Eric along and just recommend everything Sarah Polly's ever made or been in? Absolutely. And everything Claire Denis ever made. How about that? And how about your recommendation? Well, I had to go with the obvious compliment to this. Late Spring from 1949, directed by Yasujiru Ozu and starring Chishu Ryu and Setsuku Hara. It's about a dutiful young woman that lives in Tokyo with her widower father, and he conspires with her aunt to arrange her marriage, and the daughter comes to find that he may not need her the way she thought he did. I make this obvious choice mainly because I want to emphasize this case in which two films that are each great on their own enrich the experience of viewing the other one. It's an element to film viewing that we don't talk about very much. I know we make these recommendations as extensions of what we just watched, but this is one of those cases where each one really brings out something new and different in the other one. An entirely new appreciation. Denise has said a number of times that she feels a very personal connection to Ozu and how this father figure resonates with her own family history. I'm going to talk a few mild spoilers for late spring here as well, so skip ahead if you want to avoid that. I will give you a couple of seconds. 
And there are a lot of parallels between these, certainly the ones I related to. Trains, the preparation of rice. There's an analog to the night shift scene. They make a final trip together before the world crashes in. They sleep side by side, on and on and on. It is remarkable how much Denis clearly loves and pays tribute to Ozu while still fixing this ending where everyone's happiness is sacrificed to convention and duty. I love Ozu, and this is an undisputed masterpiece, but I love Denis's update as well. And the difference is most easily summed up by the paternal advice given in each film. In late spring, he says, be a good wife. In 35 Shots of Rum, he says, think of yourself. So once again, that's two great recommendations, stories we tell, and late spring. And that brings us to the end of episode 86. First and foremost, we want to say a special thanks to Jesse Dampolo for becoming our newest Patreon supporter. We appreciate that a great deal. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would also like to support that, we would certainly be grateful and we would love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes and those come out on the Mondays between regular episodes so you'll never have to go a week without New Magic Lantern in your life. Thanks for indulging my documentary choices in Septerica, and we have super fun Halloween choices coming up. It's about to get spooky on the Patreon. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We just got a very nice email from Graham Robinson recently. Thanks, Graham, for reaching out. It is always great when people share with us their own cinematic histories and experiences. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Matteo Boscarol, Andy Wolverton, Jane Sankner, Jeff Duncanson, Tim Lego, Daisuke Beppu, and the fine gentleman at Fuds on Film. Another special thanks this time to Brian Sauer for inviting me on his Just the Discs podcast to talk about the new Criterion Collection release of Susan Seidelman's Smithereens. That was a really fun conversation about a movie that I hope more people get to see now. So thanks for having me on, Brian. I appreciate it. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and now Spotify. Just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you would like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>